Well, it's great to have Morgan Ensberg here with us today on Sports Spectrum. Hey, Morgan. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing really, really good. It's good to see you. Good to talk to you. I, I love the connection that we have here with our friend Steve Merriman, who is your yeah. pitching coach. Want to brag about him just real quick at I the do. top? Yeah. I, I do want to brag about him. You know, Steve and I met at a base. So Steve was hired by the Rays, but we, I like, ironically, were at a same conference right when I found out that we had hired him. So I was able to go meet with him. And I think we both knew that we were going to hit it off. I think, you know, I mean, there's something that's very similar, I think, about us. And I think we just hit it off. And it was a great year. You know, Steve has been in the game for a long time, also very far along in his walk. Um, But I just think it was a good, it was a good experience. It was a good relationship. And it's always nice when somebody knows kind of where you're coming from, right? You know, I don't want to get too deep, but properly yoked in the sense of, you, you know, you, you kind of understand, you know, what the other person's belief system and how they want to do things. And, and Steve has been a tremendous friend. I have learned a lot from Steve. I've That's learned great. a lot from Steve and I'm very thankful that we get a chance. I'm going to hear him running his mouth about Michigan. I'm sure now. <laughs> I know. National I mean, that, champs. That, 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 you know, that's not going to stop, but I wouldn't expect it. We, we get after it with each other and the staff quite a bit. Nobody's safe in there. Nobody's well, safe in there. That's good. Well, it's great that we, I connected with Steve probably four or five years ago when he was a pitching coach up here in Hartford uh, in Connecticut where I live. And we just stayed in touch. And he's like, you got to get Morgan on because Morgan loves the Lord. And I said, I'm in. And I remembered when you played, obviously, but I want to talk about Jesus. Let's start there yeah. first. Who is Christ in the life of Morgan Ensberg right now? Yeah, so when you look back, when I look back at my life, um, my grandfather on my dad's side was a Lutheran minister. And so my dad's a PK. Um, and we grew up, ironically, going to the same church that my mom went to here in Los Angeles. So I live in Hermosa Beach. I grew up in Hermosa Beach. That is, I always tell people that's kind of by the airport. People have heard of Manhattan Beach. You know, like everybody's heard of Manhattan Beach. That, Hermosa's right next door. My mom grew up in Manhattan, went to this church um, where I went from preschool to eighth grade. The pastor, Pastor Rigg, who was at Resurrection Lutheran that I still, you know, go to today, um, was in seminary with my grandfather. So that was a strange, strange connection because my parents met at Kowloon. My dad had two choices for college, you know, being a pastor kid. He's like, you know, we're both sides of the family are Norwegian. You know I mean? Like it's, it's like Minnesota's like, you know, nor Norway West, you know, and, and, uh, my dad had two, two choices. He could go to Kowloon or he could go to St. Olaf. And so he went to Kalu and my mom was going there and that's how that happened. But so I grew up um, knowing the Lord, knowing Christ. However, I'm sure as we get into it, that doesn't mean that I understood any of it. And I think that there are also hurdles for people that grow up just in it. Um, and maybe we'll get to that, you know, yeah. in a bit. I do want to get to that actually. We can we can segue right into that because I think there's a difference between, you know, like I grew up at St. Patrick's Church in Ravina, New York, and did all the things I needed to do. And by the time I was in high school, I could care less about faith. And it wasn't until I was in my yeah. late 20s that somebody said, Do you understand about a relationship with Jesus? And I'm like, what is that? I don't even I don't think I even yeah. have any 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 idea what that is. For you, when does when does this moment of surrender, if you want to call it that? Or getting serious about your faith start to take shape? I think that I had a very similar story as the one you had, you know, you go through it and I feel like it was more like, you know, going to the, the little private, the little school is called Riviera Hall and that's connected to the church, right? So going to Riviera Hall, well, listen, we had Bible every day. We had a, you know, prayer every day. I remember uh, Mrs. Rigg, who was Pastor Rigg's wife, uh, was our kindergarten teacher, an unbelievable woman. And I remember we, the school is on a marginally busy street, and sirens would go by. 
you know, like if there was a siren and no matter what we were doing, we would stop and we would say this prayer. And I have been saying this prayer. I have, if I hear or if I see light, I have been saying this prayer since I was six. And it's God, someone's in trouble. We don't know who, but you do. Please help them. Amen. Wow. The reason why I bring that up, the reason why I bring that up is because it has been almost ingrained in me to have a prayer life. However, however, even though since very young and even up into today, I have had a ongoing conversation with God. Like it's a lot. It's in the car. It's in between walking from upstairs to downstairs uh, and, and, and having that relationship. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. It was just something like, yeah, I'm Christian. I believe in Christ. I believe he died for our sins. You know what I mean? Like, I, I believe he rose. You know what I mean? Like all those things. But I didn't get it. And I think that that really came more as an adult, right? Like more, um, I was in the minor leagues and started going to baseball chapel. And then also I went down to Venezuela to play in winter ball. And I sat there and I said, you know, here I am, a pastor's grandkid. I know all the stories, like I know all the stories of the Bible, right? Like, you know, we, 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 we know those. And I go, I have never sat down and read the Bible. And so I'm like, well, all right, I'm just going to sit down. I'm going Genesis. I'm going to battle my tail off through numbers. And <laughs> I hear it. I, I hear it. Numbers, I feel it. I sat there and, I was, and, and please forgive me, but like, I still have no clue what that's about. I'm like, holy mackerel. Like what? This is accounting. Yeah. Um, but I, I just sat down and I just slowly took my time. It wasn't a race. And I read the Bible. So you know, I think it, it came much later for me. And let's make no mistake about it. Like, I was a decent kid in the sense that I didn't get in trouble at school. I didn't get arrested. You know what I mean? Like, I wasn't sneaking out of the house. We had um, a curfew. I always made curfew, except for one time I didn't make curfew. And I went back to my house and I said, hey, mom and dad, I've got to take Billy back home. And they gave me the okay on that. So I, I, I made it, but then I didn't make it, but I wasn't in trouble for that. Wow. Um, so yeah. So was, you're reading I the Bible, right? Kid. You're reading the Bible in the minor leagues or even in Venezuela. I think you said, what changes? Like what, what, where do we go from that to your baseball career as you get to the major leagues? Like what's, mm -hmm. what's going on? Is there a transformation that you start to see take shape over the years? I think that just, having more curiosity about the stories and how that relates to us, not, not, not really salvation questions, but more how to live your life. You know, like, I think that as you read the Bible more, it's a living work, right? Like, I mean, and you learn more things, prayer helps you just um, more things. And maybe it's like, perhaps, perhaps an example is that maybe, you know, your relationship with Christ in a sense is, is like baking a cake. Like, I guess I could have speed read through the, you know, I guess I could have speed read through the Bible, but I don't think that would have done anything. I think that you're baking a cake. It's going to take a certain amount of time with certain ingredients. And then, you know, slowly things will become part of it. You know, I think if we look at a plot point in my life, in 2000, I was involved in a holdup in spring training where uh, guys in ski masks came in to um, our hotel room. And long story short, we were hogtied with the riot ties. I still have uh, scars on my wrist. Um, wow. But, you know, like the, the riot ties, you know, we were, we were hogtied with our ankles and our wrists. Wow. And then had uh, tape over your mouth. And like, I remember the guy had a gun to the back of my head and said, are you a hero? And I just sat there like, no. And during that time, it was interesting because I remember saying a prayer and I said, Lord, please forgive me for my sins. I'm so sorry. But I'll tell you what, I just am not okay with this. Like this 
stinks. However, however, if this is what you want, I'm like, let's do it. And at that point, I was ready to die. And so I've experienced that. And I think as a plot point, that kind of, that shakes you. But even after that, man, I've messed up so much in my life. So much I've messed up. I've, I mean, I'm talking flaming cartwheel of a landing. I'm talking where I have been trying to be in control. And that is my biggest battle. My biggest battle today and my biggest battle at all times is asking God to be in control of my life. Because if not, I'm simply going on autopilot. It's not that I'm disobedient. It's not that I'm, it's that I'm just going through my life and I'm a sinful guy. And if I don't ask consciously in the front of my mind for God to be in control of my life, things just go off kilter. Hmm. Wow. I didn't know about the holdup story. That's that if, if anything, where whatever you believe, moments like that will will take you to Christ right away, I feel like, you know, whether that was it or not. So for me it was interesting too, because like here in lies wasn't a belief problem. Right. Right. And this actually was this is when I was there, and I remember doing it because I remember where I was, I can put myself back in that time and I can feel that, right? Like when I recall that story, I can feel my feelings and how I was scared and things like that. But that was also a confirmation of, that was just another one of the, you know, multiple prayers and conversation with God that I have during the day since I have been five. You know what I mean? Like it just, it was reactive. And I, I, I always get a smidge embarrassed about it because I was sitting there like, not angry, but I was not happy. I was like, this is BS, bro. Like, this is not cool. Like, this is scary movie type stuff. And I have no clue why this is happening. The irony, okay, the irony, 19 years later, I'm managing in double A with the, with the Rays here. And we have a terrible pro, you know, story where one of our pitchers is involved, meaning his, his wife, his 18 month old son and his uh, mother-in-law are murdered. And I escort him from Montgomery back to his house in Southern Virginia and it was interesting because I don't know exactly what that feels like, right? However, I understood something that was somewhat similar to that situation. And I had gone through things that wasn't as bad as that, like not even close. But I was able, from my experience in 2000 and all the therapy you do after, you know, I mean, it's a scary deal, Beryl. I mean, it's a, you need to talk to somebody. Yeah. Um, but I was able to be there for Blake Bivens and, and escort him. And so there you see the irony, right? I hope I'm done with that particular thing in life. But, you know, 19 years later, holy macro, I've got some reference points to, to help a guy like this. Yeah, it's really interesting to think, you know, we always say sometimes you got to go through trials or the valleys to understand why God puts us through certain situations, right? And then 19 years later, you're seeing the Lord, not that he put you in that situation, but he allowed that situation to happen. But he right. always says he's going to work together all things to good for those that love him. And I'm not saying what happened to your player was good, but the fact that you could relate, you could comfort, you could just be of, along with him and maybe even begin to share a little bit of what you were feeling. I don't know. That feels like God's... I think he nailed it, way. right? Right. Like yeah. he works everything for the good. And you're right. Like God didn't sit there and say, send, you know, guys and scheme. Here, here we go. Like here, you know, puppet and like, here we go. That's not how this world nor he designed this. However, God ultimately has the power. Like at the end of the day, he's got the trump card. Like he can come over the top. And I think that, you know, you see opportunities. You know, I think that I had always thought in a similar vein, not this bad, but in a good way, in a similar vein, I had always thought that I had gotten to the big leagues and had a career in the big leagues so that I could play professional baseball and make a bunch of money and, 
and play well. And after going through that and going through um, my walk, I realized, oh my gosh, I'm playing baseball so that people can know that I believe in God and believe in Christ. Now, I'm not outwardly like, I don't have a, you know, a, a, a Jesus tattoo and droon, you know, or rule letters, right? Like, you know, um, things like that. But I think that like most things, watch the person's actions, right? Like watch the person's actions. And, and it turned out the irony is that, you know, I think I played baseball as, you know, part of my declaration to, to Christ. We're talking to Morgan Ensberg here on Sports Spectrum. I want to go back two years before that incident that you talked about, 1998. It feels like a pretty good year when I was looking at your your journey, right? Like College World Series champ, drafted by Houston, rookie league champion in the minor. I mean, 1998 seems like a pretty good year for Morgan Ensberg. You know, I, I had a really good run. You know, I mean, it was we had a national championship team. Um, I went to SD. Uh, the real SC, yes, out, out in LA. The one, the one in um, Los Angeles. That's right. <laughs> yeah, the one in Los Angeles. You know, Beach Kid. Um, but we had a we had a great team, and and we got a chance to win the national championship. And I did get drafted. You know, I got drafted by the Astros in the ninth round, so respectable, but not first round. You know, I mean, like not not by no means would this be a slam dunk. Um. And again, the irony was we had really good players, man. Like teammates were really good and and we ended up winning. So we won the national championship. And then I went to my short season team in Auburn, New York, and we won that championship. That core of guys went to high A Kissimmee, won that championship. We went to double A uh, Round Rock. That's now triple A, but Round Rock with the Ryans, you know, Nolan Ryan, Reed Ryan, Reese Ryan, Wendy Ryan. All, all the runs, um, and won that. And then in AAA in New Orleans, which is also is no longer a team, but there we won that. So yeah. we had a core group of guys that just went through. Uh, so it was a it was a special time. It was a good run. I mean, you're the only guy. A, I mean, you're the only guy, the only MLB player to win a championship in college, rookie league, single A, double A, triple A, and then play in a World Series. Uh, I mean, you must have thought winning was, this is just how it works. So it's interesting. I am a big believer in you learn how to win. I believe winning is an actual skill. Okay. For example, let, let's look at it in another way. Let's pretend like we are in second grade and <laughs> we have a spelling test, right? Like we have a spelling test and let's say it's 10 words and a bonus word. We practice, there needs to be a way, but we, you know, if we practice those, those words and, and put the time in correctly, there's a really good chance we're going to get an A on that test, right? Like we're going to, and I have had, you know, the, the, the great fortune, not by my own, right? Like I didn't choose it, but I've had incredible um, coaches and managers and I used to play soccer and basketball. Um, I had incredible soccer coaches. I had incredible basketball coaches. I had incredible baseball coaches. Uh, but there is a desire in me that's not always good. And it's something that I've had to really work on. But like, I really want to win. You know what I mean? And the battle that I have, that I, that I deal with and I have to detach from is that my worth, my worth is not built on the win. I'm not a bad person if a team eventually loses, right? Like I'm not a, you know, and it's very difficult for me. The I, Wins and losses, and I'm in development, right? So development is about doing what's best for the players to get them to the big league. And that's what I have to default to and detach to. But um, winning is just something I've been very fortunate to do. I've never been on a losing team in any sport, right? So I'm not, I don't, you know, whether that's been an amateur ball or, or pro ball. So I, I'm, I'm just, you know, used to, but I believe that I have been taught how to win. And so we teach that to the players. In 2005, you made it to the world series, but you didn't win. It wasn't the outcome you wanted. Did that teach right. you at all about how to, I mean, that's not a losing season. Certainly. I mean, you're the, you're the champions of, I think at the time the national league. So yeah. 
but you didn't win. So was that kind of, what was that time like trying to handle that? Uh, look, I mean, it's tough, man. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, there's only one team each year in each sport, you know, that, that ends on, on a win. And, you know, we didn't. And, you know, again, I think that it was a, a great experience. I'm very thankful that I got a chance to do it. But no, we want to win. You know, and how do you deal with that? I think that there is a strange combination of thankfulness and disappointment, right? When I look back, you know, I wasn't so I wasn't so de devastated at the time that I couldn't function, you know, but I think, you know, these are hard losses. This is a pinnacle, right? Like, this is why you do this. And um, it was a great series. Like, it was, you know, it was so close. It was Every it was game was close. Series. Even though it was a sweep, you would never yeah. know if you really looked yeah. deeper into the games. And and the White Sox at the time were just, we were, we were, we were good. Like, we were you know, playing well, but they were on fire, man. Like they were just, it's one of those things where it's just a timing deal. And um, I think they had only w lost like one playoff game. Don't quote me on that, but I mean, they were steamrolling. Um, but, you know, yeah, I mean, I think that again, all these things that happen that go against what you want, as if you know what is good for you, you know, I think are all times um, for reflection. And yes, we were happy about it. But yeah, there's there's disappointment. There's still disappointment about it today. Sure. When did you realize God was calling you into coaching and development? It's a very good question. You know, I think getting back to getting... So I had a pastor, um, Doug Sutherland, and unfortunately he passed away, but he, he's a guy, he passed away a couple of years Over the past six or seven years, I, I was talking to a lot. And uh, Doug was incredible in that he taught me two, two major things. One was we were talking earlier about asking God to be in control of your life, right? Like that was one thing and, and talking about Jesus needs to be on the throne, not you. Okay, got it, coach. Okay. And I said, well, what do I do? He says, you simply say, yes, God, thank you. Please be in control of my life. Like, and then go. Okay. Second part, I would go up to Doug and say, Doug, I'll, what does God want? Like, I'll do whatever, like, I don't care, man. I'll do what he wants. And he's smiling and stuff. And he's like, that's not how it works, Morgan. You ask him what you want. And then you kind of work at it. And if, it, if the doors open and if you ask God to be in control, that's how these things, you know, open up. And so it was much more, you know, I knew early on that although I'm thankful for my playing career, um, I knew that I was always a teacher. And I knew that my biggest impact and what I'm best at is teaching people how to play baseball and encouraging them. I'm not a yeller. I don't come down on players. It's not like that at all. I catch them doing good. And I knew that when I was playing even in like college. Hmm. That when baseball was done, I was going to, I didn't know if it was going to be pro ball or, or college, but I knew I was going to be a coach and I knew that I was meant to coach. Hmm. So you come to this Tampa Bay Rays organization, the Montgomery Biscuits, by the way, aren't minor league baseball teams the best with their nicknames? <laughs> the I mean, best. The best. They're the best. I mean, they have such cool gear. <laughs> yes. I mean, they have such cool gear and stuff and you'll see, they also do kind of sometimes where they'll do these alternate team names or something. And, and those get fun too. But I listen, I absolutely love the minor leagues. I know that the eventual goal is to get to the big leagues, but I'm telling you, man, like I absolutely love the minor leagues. I love it. I, I think there's such a neat thing about the minor leagues, the purity of baseball too. And the challenge, what I would ask you though, being a follower of Christ, how do you, how do you bring your faith and carry it with you, and how does it influence you in your coaching? Okay, so I think again, like one when I when I first meet the players or first meet the coaching staff, it, you know, even if um, usually there's new people on the coaching staff, and there's virtually always new players, and I tell both of them in two different ways, um, you know, don't don't listen to a word I say, like watch my actions. And then later on, I mean, I don't mean 
don't completely not listen, but I, I, I'm set up very clearly, watch my actions. And over time, if my actions back up what we're talking about, then you can have belief. And I didn't used to be like that. Seven years ago, I wasn't like that. You know, when I got into coaching, you know, I think there were some plot points in my life that, you know, really changed and, and were very difficult. And I just really, I think, slowly started to get it. And I have this chain too. I mean, like, so I don't, I don't put this out, like this stays in here, but I mean, it does pop out. But I think that like most people, I, I just don't think that for me standing, you know, in the middle of the, the locker room on a table discussing Christ openly, like meaning like that, I just don't think it's a good tactic. I think what happens is I think it's attraction, right? And I think that slowly over time you see somebody and you're like, you know, there's something about that person that I like, that I'm attracted to. And so I think that when you have the interactions, when I have the interactions with coaches and players and things like that, I think that you can tell that at its foundation, it's a Christ-based foundation. And then I will end up talking to players if they want to talk about, you know, Christ, no problem, let's do it. But I'm not, I, I'm not a Bible thumper, like I'm not coming over the top. You know, yeah. and, and, and asking about, you know, salvation, you know, let, 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 tell me your, your four favorite points about Calvinism, right? Like, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not, you know, no. give me your eighth favorite, you know, Bible verse. You're like, okay, well, okay. Well, I always say you represent Christ by how you carry yourself. And mm -hmm. what's the best representation, representation of Christ? Well, if you want to be like Christ, you're loving others, you're serving mm -hmm. others, you're caring for others, you're, you're out there being the best example, representative, ambassador, whatever word you want to use for him. And sometimes you don't, I mean, I don't necessarily agree with the line that I'll never ever have to talk about Jesus. They can just watch my actions and they'll know. Mm. I do mm -hmm. think eventually you have to share your faith somehow, but I think yes. it's got to be, like you said, almost an attraction. I mean, I don't think people, many people don't get saved today or begin a relationship with God by people yelling at them and telling them you're going to hell, man. If you don't, if you don't come to like, that's, I don't it's know a if that's bad ever strategy. Yeah, it's it's I a agree. bad strategy. And by the way, it doesn't work with anyone. And by the way, the other thing, this is very similar with um, the military, you know, outside of Vietnam, the whole purpose of, of not having a draft is to have people with buy-in, right? Like right. not fear, but like you want to have buy-in. I should, I guess I, as I think about this a little bit, I do talk about God a lot. I mean, I, as I think about just how I, you know, and, and I, because I say a lot of times, I talk a lot about with the players and the coaches about it's very important to keep our side of the street clean. Okay. And if that means that you have to have, I think we all have things in our lives, right? Like, I think that each life is pretty similar when you, when you really get inside to the heart. And, you know, I have a situation, you know, in my life where there's like, there has to be a boundary. Like they're just at, like, there has to be a boundary. It's completely, you know, out of control. Right. And so there's a boundary and it's like, that's in its own compartment, like, you know, over here, but you know, the rest of the, the, the rest of the parts and so forth, I'm talking about God, you know what I mean? Like I'm talking about God and asking God to be in control of my life. And I'll say that to players, but I'll talk to about, look, if your side of the street is not clean off the field, it's going to show up on the field. And I think that as you hear me speak more and more, because God does come up, um, I think that you just see foundational things that alert people that this guy thinks possibly a little bit differently. And, and that's how these conversations happen. And baseball chapel. I mean, they know. Of I mean, course. Yeah, there's opportunities I mean, to stay connected to the Lord all throughout yeah. the season. Or, you know, I'm talking to a player in the office you know, I gauge most of my year on how often players come into the office. And it's just, we have, we're, you know, each year you get better and better at developing the relationships and stuff. And so we got players in the office and we're having a hoot. They're struggling with something. It's not uncommon for me to think of a biblical story. It's not uncommon for me to think of scripture. It's not uncommon, you know, you know, if that is, I don't, like, I don't, but if there is an apples to apples 
comparison about this. I mean, if we think about Jesus in Gethsemane, you know what I mean? Like that's real fear, man. I mean, that, that, that's some scary. And, and I can't, I still struggle. Like I can't wrap my mind around that fear. Like I'm sure that even when I had the gun to the back of my head, I'm pretty sure that wasn't what Jesus was feeling. Like, you know, to have such worry and stuff. Um, but you do get a lot of opportunities to talk about it directly and indirectly. Yeah. And I, I think that's just you being you, you know, and you would ask mm-hmm. the same for any player or any coach that's in your, that's on your team is just be yourself. And if yeah. conversations can come up that way, uh, even better, even better. So um, think, let me ask you, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. No, all I was going to say is that, you know, this idea of being yourself and authenticity and so forth, I think it's important and I think that we constantly, you know, I'm a person that looks in the mirror a lot. Like my default is that I messed up, right? Like my default is not like you're the problem, right? My default is, um, well, if you did this correctly, that wouldn't happen. Well, if you did that, you know, correct, like very much beating up myself. Um, And that is something that is a battle. You know, that's another uh, battle. However, I think that I'm connecting this to being yourself. Even though that's something that's a part of me, I actively am like, no, like, that's not right. Like, you, you aren't the, the full cause of every single problem, you know, that, that encounters. And just having the humbleness and, and knowing that there's grace and, and feeling the comfort of knowing that I can just be myself, you know? So even when I have these hiccups of thinking of this self doubt and this, I beat myself up there. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I need to love myself more and that's something that I work on. Um, but I think that I'm, I'm always authentic. Like I'm the same in the house as I am on the field. No, that's good. That's all you can ask. As we wind down, I wanted to ask you, just sort of not getting caught. You, you you said the ultimate goal someday is to manage in the big leagues. Um, how do you not get caught up in looking too far down the road and kind of staying present? And, you know, I, I've heard it say bloom where you're planted, right? Blooming right where mm-hmm. you are without not getting caught up and trying to make, is it very similar to when you were playing and when you were in the minor leagues and not getting caught up and getting to the big leagues? It's definitely not similar for me. Yeah. Um, I think that the people that had, good perspective it was but not for me in fact even a few years into coaching and managing um it was the same as a player where it was get there get there get there and i'm 48 now and i've had a lot of life experience like i really am enjoying um this age i'm still active like my body still works like i feel great you know i have strength i'm able to do stuff with the players and show them things Um, but I think I've had a bunch of things in my life, not go the way that you'd like them. And like I was saying earlier, everybody has things in their lives that are terrible, you know, and I too have things that are awful, um, in my life. And what it has really shown is that I am not in control. And if there is a theme to what we've been talking about, it's been about asking God to be in control of your life because here I am like, get to the big league, get to the big league. I can't control that. What I do know is that I'm always exactly where I need to be. God has me exactly where I need to be. And so this only happened two years ago where, yes, I would love to be a major league manager. Yes, I would love to get to the big leagues. But my right now, I'm going to Durham AAA. Like my job is to manage and coach here and do the best job I can, you know, like with that. And I know that I'm exactly where I need to be at all times. And so I'm on autopilot in respect to that. I try really hard. I work very hard. But whatever happens will happen, and I'm okay with that. That's a great perspective. He is Morgan Ensberg. Uh, thank you. Thanks for coming on the show, man. Great to meet you. And uh, hopefully we'll connect again in person. But I really appreciate you sharing your story with us. Yeah. Hey, come on down to Durham, man. It's Durham Bulls, man. We can hit hit the bull, get a steak. Let's, Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. I'm on my way. <laughs> Thanks, Morgan. Do it. Thanks for having me. 
Hey, thanks for watching Sports Spectrum here on YouTube. You can click our next video or you can check out our website, sportsspectrum.com.